Dear Mayor, welcome Abdallah. to <laughs> welcome to Dearborn Open Mic, and thanks everyone who made it here uh, tonight. Given that we don't get many Sundays in Michigan, so don't be scared from the paper. It's just I don't want to forget some of the comments, and we're squeezed uh, with time. So first of all, I want to deliver the greetings of Ambassador Dr. Ali Ajami. Uh, to you, the president of the Arab American Center for Culture and Arts, who was not able to be with us today because he's in overseas. And he wants to thank you on behalf of the executive board of the center and on behalf of all of us for giving us your valuable time. So uh, Dome was born out of Dearborn Blog. Dearborn Blog was founded in 2013. Uh, it was a reaction to the spotlight shed on Dearborn that was predominantly negative at that time and remarkably inaccurate. And when people came to defend it, most of what they offered is our traditional food that we show generosity through and our folklore and dance. We wanted to show that there is much more to Dearborn than that, so we created a platform where uh, Dearborners can express themselves, can uh, provide their thoughts and feelings and intellect. Ten years since that time, the narrative is changing and there is nothing more powerful in the change of that narrative than you becoming the mayor of Dearborn. So I have a few questions and then we'll open up the questions to the audience. So although many are still getting Dearborn wrong, Sometimes even people so close, closely tied to the administration who, for example, in 2020 thought of describing social distancing in a sign posted in West Dearborn as 24 shawarmas apart, which they uh, came to discover that it wasn't funny and uh, kind of, of course, intentionally, it was unintentional, but it was a reduction of our culture uh, to shawarma. But, only an Arab American would probably get that uh, firsthand or get that, you know, get that uh, point without uh, much thought to it. Well, now we have an Arab American mayor. So how do you envision the entwining of the Arab American culture and legacy into Dearborn's heritage? You have, you have two things that you're, you're mixing together. Uh, they have been coexisting and they have been uh, uh, living in, in one space together. And now, in your persona, it is, it is the most symbolic thing of the intermixing and integrating of these two legacies, the Arab American legacy and the Dearborn great legacy. And sometimes it's challenging to mix these two histories. So how do you, how do you, see, how do you handle this challenge? On the note of the, the shawarma, I want to start there. When I came into office, I met with that team. And they gave me their new marketing deck to market our downtown West Dearborn and downtown East Dearborn. And they're giving me the presentation. I'm sitting quietly and I'm going to picture after picture. The first picture was at Wagner Park, uh, a group of uh, uh, white and, and, and black individuals sitting in the park. Beautiful picture. The second picture was a picture of a white couple with a white child riding a bike. Uh, the third picture was a picture of an interracial couple holding hands walking through downtown Dearborn. And the fourth picture was a woman in hijab holding a box of batlewa. And I closed the deck and I let her finish her presentation. And I said, why didn't you just take a picture of who hangs out at Wagner Park on any random day? Like, why did you hire these people to stand there to take pictures who are not even from Dearborn? Um, and she said, well, we just wanted to make sure it was staged, controlled environment, so on and so forth. And I told her, I said, you know, if you were working in the black community, would you put a picture of a black individual eating something stereotypical that's typically characterized of, of the black community like you did a woman in hijab holding a box of batlewa? And she just got quiet, not understanding what was wrong with the pitch deck. Three months later, the whole firm was fired. Um, and so we brought, we insourced it. And sometimes I think the problem is you rely on folks outside the community to do the job for something that's needed from somebody who's within the community, understanding the perspective and diversity. You talk about two greatnesses, which is Dearborn and Arab community. It should be looked at as one. Dearborn story has a Arab American story. I think the best thing that we can do is to not distinguish between the two, but to tell the story that the Arab American community has allowed the Dearborn as a city to flourish. 
And so what we don't do is we don't shy away from who we are. If you look at our administration, we have the most diverse administration in the city's history. Uh, we went from only one out of American appointee, technically, ever in the city's history, to now 60% of my appointees are minority. I have a Syrian, an Egyptian, a Yemeni, a Lebanese, with a, 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 a wide uh, breadth of the Arab diaspora represented within the city. And I think that is how you begin to tackle this when it's no longer new, when it becomes standardized, when we elevate Arab art and Arab culture without having to apologize that, oh, I'm not trying to accommodate. I'm, it's a part of the Dearborn community. It's me saying my name Abdullah and not Abdullah. Uh, it's all these things that I think add with time. The normalization that the Arab community is here is something we're proud of. It's something we elevate and we don't shy away from. And those who stigmatize, they are in the wrong because the most radical thing is actually ignorance. Um, and that's what's present. Thank you. So one of the aspirations that we had at the Arab American Center for Culture and Arts is the question, can Dearborn become a capital of Arab American culture and arts? It's definitely uh, entitled to, it's definitely has uh, a lot of the, uh, what nominates it to, to become one. Uh, how do you envision when you hear that name? What would, what would make Dearborn genuinely a capital of culture and arts? How can we attract Arabic art, Arab American art, Arab American culture from all over the country to congregate and have incentives to move to Dearborn? First and foremost, I mean, we're sitting inside the Arab American National Museum. I'd be remiss if we didn't mention yeah. this beautiful institution that we have that no other city or state has in the whole exactly, country. Exactly, the only one. We have to elevate that. Secondly, you have to display the art in public places. This institution is beautiful, but it's not enough to have art in a closed building. You know, I just came from the pop artist mural that just completed at Salina Elementary. And it's a beautiful depiction of a, a, a portion of the Arab American community proudly on a staple within the city of Dearborn. We are trying to work on building murals across Warren Avenue corridor, Michigan East corridor, Michigan West corridor. This is a promising opportunity for Arab American artists to come to display their art publicly, to receive reward for it, obviously paying for that art, but for us to display it proudly. I think that's what's most important. So a person just driving by whose attention is caught by such a beautiful piece outside um, can walk away with something potentially if you're not from the city of Dearborn with an understanding of what is Dearborn about, whether it's the beauty of Arabic calligraphy or any other type of mosaic or, or art piece. I think that's how you do it. E East Michigan Avenue is trying to be an art conclave. We have the art space lofts. There's some additional pieces, um, but we have to do a better job in elevating that art publicly. Most folk don't know what happens inside of our space. People don't know what happens inside of this museum, which is why you have to meet people with, with where they are. Um, there's no reason why we can't begin to incorporate uh, out of American artists and vendors within the various festivals that are happening across the city. Um, I think that's how you begin to break that down. Would that, would that something that you would aspire for, for Dearborn to be called as such? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. I think when you look to cities like Anaheim, California, which has the title Little Arabia, I don't know how. I don't know how Anaheim, California has, has passed a resolution signifying little Arabia exists in Anaheim when we are the capital of Arab America. But there's never been the, you know, the will to actually cement it, whether it's via resolution or via signage or via art. And I think we're, we are, we're willing and more than we're, we're working on towards doing that. Uh, many Dearborn residents, especially newer immigrants, have not fully grasped the aspects of American civil life. The separation between church and state, the freedom of expression, freedom of religion, etc. And many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans have found ways to marry between their faith and the American values at their personal, at a subjective level. But you have a more challenging situation because of your leadership position. It takes tremendous leadership to maneuver as a civil leader these cultural pressures while maintaining our constitutional values. And in my opinion, you have been doing a tremendous job. And I cannot imagine anyone doing it better. I've heard a lot of your interviews and the way you answer them is a uh, right, you know, perfect way. For example, why, while you are Muslim by faith, you are pro-choice, you defend the constitutional and human and civil rights granted to the LGBTQ community. 
and you defend the freedom of speech, you defended our public libraries, and you have always been a strong advocate of public schools, and you preach tolerance, while you also accommodate as much as possible the religious institutions in the community and their continued demands for public events, etc. And you have brought Eid al-Fitr to the city, for example, your uh, Ramadan to the state capital when you were back a representative. What is your philosophy of tolerance that you uh, integrate both your faith and your civil duty in? That's a, that's a very challenging question. Um, first, I would disagree with you that I've done it perfectly. Uh, I have many a conversations with many mentors um, talking about the struggle, uh, where the improvements lie in every statement I've ever made. You know, how can I improve? What can I do better? I always think there's always room for improvement. Um, second, uh, you know, I, would, I grew up, uh, you know my family, you know Ami, and I lean on him for, for much. I grew up that my faith compels me to work on perfecting my own morals and values and not to cast judgment and try to perfect somebody else's. That is what I am responsible for. So that's how I practice my faith. My faith is not to, uh, we Sam does one, two, and three, oh, he's gonna, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made me the judge of anything. Um, let me work on myself. Um, when I'm in office, the hat I wear, certainly, I, I don't shy away from who I am. I'm Abdullah Hussein Hamoud, it doesn't go away. But I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and the city of the Code and Ordinances of the City of Dearborn. And that is a tough path to navigate wearing the hats that I wear. And so what I do is try to say, great, what is the best decision for the city of Dearborn, for all of its residents, in a secular American society? My job is to not enforce some perspective that might be overseas or to bring some sort of religious law. That's not what I'm, I'm sworn to uphold the Constitution of the US, Michigan, and the city of Dearborn. And that's what I do. This comes back to my opening statement of sometimes people have a tough time navigating the criticisms of me as mayor and criticisms of me as Muslim. Um, and I think we also have come to a point in our city where disagreement means disrespect. And I'm not, I'm not sure why. We should be able to disagree without casting disrespect. Um, and we in the Arab community don't do that well. Uh, we disagree, and then when we have the Sahra on Sunday nights on your front porch eating batikh and drinking shai, we're shit-talking you because we disagreed. Uh, that's what we do. Um, then also what I say is, unfortunately, Arab or Muslims more you know, predominantly have created their hierarchy of sin. It's okay to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, but you cannot do the following. Um, and internally, they've, they've comprehended it that way, and I think that is a Muslim struggle more than a, a life struggle. Um, and so my job, again, do the best for all the people. It's not to be the Muslim mayor. It's to be the mayor who happens to be Muslim. Uh, and you have to understand that. Thank you. Final question before we open it to the audience. So uh, the future of Arabic as a second language in Dearborn, there is, uh, uh, Dearborn is, is always at a, uh, um, a testing stage of its, uh, the, the preservation of its Arabic language. It has been a struggle. I'm sure you've lived it yourself. Uh, and every, uh, every child in the city who's, uh, who's, who grew up in an Arab American family has lived that struggle of his family and himself or herself trying to preserve their language. The city, does it have, does the city have um, the Arabic language, flourishing the Arabic language as a second language in the city because it carries so much culture within it, because it can be also good for business, etc. cetera. Uh, is it on the city's agenda? I, we've never thought about designating it by resolution. But I can tell you what we're putting in practice. Last year, we passed the, um, the ruling to make uh, Arabic translated ballots the first city in the country to do so for all elections moving forward. That was one thing we brought forward. Secondly, we're working with Google now on a new partnership so we can translate all documents in our website in authentic Arabic um, that we're constructing and every single document that exit the city also in Arabic. And we even have our chat bot right now. It's in pilot mode. We actually nicknamed it Wasta. And so if you go to the website, Wasta opens up and is prepared to help you. Um, and you can talk to the chatbot in Arabic, English, or Spanish. Um, and it will respond to questions that we have actually programmed. And it's taking note of other questions we haven't responded to yet. So we're beginning to incorporate it so it becomes normalized in city practice. 
Um, via resolution or such, you know, that's something we can always have a conversation about working with council. Um, but for me, it's less, resolutions are typically symbolic and don't mean anything in practice. What we're trying to do is ingratiate this within the city of Dearborn, so it's actual policy and practice, regardless of who's sitting as mayor. It shouldn't take a lot of mayor to make sure we have Arabic translations. You should cement it in every process across the whole city. So once I'm gone, regardless of who's in that seat, it's there, and it'll be very difficult to remove. That's it, the more, the more promising. I'm gonna squeeze one more question, and then we're gonna take questions. That question is with the changing demography of Dearborn. Uh, as, we, as we know from the prices of houses and the rent, there is a very high demand. It's a sort uh, over city. Is there plans to uh, deal with that, uh, such as having a higher uh, rise buildings, kind of uh, building a Williamsburg for Manhattan, uh, if, if, if uh, D downtown Detroit is the Manhattan. We are working with many developers who've come across land about building such developments. The question most of the developers have, and uh, the good news is most of these developers are Dearborn residents, and, and many of them are Muslim Arab American. The question they have though, they always say, Does, would Jama'atna live in such a thing? Because we have no, Case example you can point to. There is no 15-story building in the city of Dearborn that's filled with young people. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that. And so they're trying to assess the market and understanding our community. Have we, pro, you know, have we come to a point where, yeah, you know what? A 20-story building will actually fill with a lot of Arab families who have larger families. Because we all want basements and square footage and backyards garages. and garages, which is this whole separate conversation, okay? Uh, and so the question is though, would you take a 600 square foot one bedroom apartment? It hasn't been tested in the market yet. And so that's why they're all, we're conducting a market study now as a city to try to help the developers with making that decision. And so we're working through it. Some of them are looking at like four to six floors, but the question if you want true density, you're talking nine floors plus. And the well, other thing you have to combat is nimbyism. You know, people always say, yes, I want a high rise, but I don't want it in my neighborhood. I want a high rise, but make sure it's all market rate high end because I don't want X and X to move in. And so we also have to understand, you know, we all came as immigrants. How in God's name did it become that we now want to frown on those that have come with little to nothing? Because alhamdulillah, we've made it, we've moved to the West End, and we're saying, oh, but look at these people coming now. That was you 20 years ago. That was your father, that was your grandfather, that was your mother, your grandmother. And it, so that, we also have to combat that to some capacity. And so I don't like to use the phrase affordable housing. I like to use the phrase workforce housing. And if you just graduated recently, you're looking for a job, you're not making six figures, you have to be able to afford your rent, and your rent shouldn't be 50% of your 